I'd sold the business in France, was, was on my way back to the UK, intending to launch another fashion business, had a very nasty car crash, and woke up in hospital, um, actually in, in, in the UK, having been air ambulance back to the UK over a matter of two or three days. But he woke up in hospital in a ward where there was a long-term sick mother of two babies. And as I gradually got better and was able to sort of chat to my neighbour in, in the bed next door to me, she commented on the huge lack of a nice, affordable, fashionable, trendy children's wear available by mail order because she was trying to buy from her hospital bed for these children because she was in hospital for several months. So that sort of sparked the idea that I, at that stage I hadn't had children, I had no intention of doing anything in this market, but um, my, my fellow uh, hospital inmate sparked the idea um, to do something in that market. Predominantly uh, putting the collection together uh, finding the factories, shooting the collection. It involved um, finding models, out-of-work models, or friends who I thought could be models, which um, I later realised that professional models were worth their weight in gold. Um, uh, finding a photographer who would do it on a low budget, finding a location, printing a catalogue. I only printed, I think we printed 30,000 copies of our first catalogue. We now print about eight or 900,000, even though catalogue is a small part of our business. Um, but printing 30,000 catalogues, um, uh, making your collection. I, amazingly enough, even though it was a new business, I did persuade people to give me credit terms for that first order. And had I not had those credit terms, we'd have never, we'd have never launched the company. I was determined to keep everything in-house. So one of the things that I am very good at is if I don't know how to do something, I will ask. So we didn't employ a PR company. We didn't employ a marketing agency, even though um, mail order is quite technical. You need to really analyse your lists that you are, are, are renting in the case that you are renting lists. Um, so we really did, or I did, because I didn't, you know, it was only me in those days. Um, I did everything in house and I learned as I went along if I didn't know how to do something, I would find someone to ask. And, you know, generally people, especially if they're slightly further up the, um, the ladder in their careers, they don't mind giving you advice. It's always been very important to me to grow organically. Um, I'm not, <laughs> oddly enough for an entrepreneur, I'm not a great risk taker. Um, of course I take enormous risks. Every time we print a catalogue, we're investing about a million pounds. Every time we, we buy a fabric now, or we design a fabric. I mean, when I'm working with the, uh, the designers and we decide we're going to do a certain print, um, we're probably investing about 5,000 pounds in, in the fabric alone now. And we've got to take a risk. So there are always risks. But in my case, they're calculated risks. And this is why we will be a very safe company. I mean, I, I, you know, I hope one never knows what could happen. But um, I really wanted to be able to sleep at night whilst being an entrepreneur. People say, oh, entrepreneurs go out of business, they start again, they rise from the ashes. I've not been out of business and I really don't want to experience it. I'm, you know, possibly I'm getting too old now, but really I'd rather not. I've also got a hugely moralistic attitude to business. And I, I, I kind of take badly to people who do declare themselves bankrupt, clear their debts, sometimes putting a lot of smaller companies out of business and then rise from the ashes um, the next day as a company that is in effect the same company that they've just cleared all the debts of. And I find that it just doesn't sit well with me and I don't like that way of doing business. Keep your overheads as low as possible. Work from home if that's what it takes. I know it's nice to have a glam office. Um, it's very nice to have a flashy red company car sitting outside that office. But actually, what's the point if you're only going to drive it for two years and then some HP company is going to come and repossess it? We buy every single car that we own in the company in cash because it's so much cheaper. People, people's heads get full of nonsense. Um, I do have a private car, which is quite nice, but you know, on the whole, um, you know, people's heads get full of nonsense and they forget what they're actually doing. What we're trying to do is build a brand, uh, build a company, and we're building it for longevity. We're not going to be a flash in the pan. I want my children, if, if the company's still around, I want my children to have the opportunity of working for the company if it's still there. We have to have that, 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 that point of difference. 
our stores have uh, feeding areas, they have customer toilets, they um, have fresh flowers, they have, uh, they have a white shop fit, which has to be kept clean. Occasionally, we get let down, and we do. I mean, I'm afraid. I do walk around stores and, you know, do, do that with my finger and check for dust, because if, if, if they're not kept clean, a customer with a newborn baby won't want to go in there and spend a lot of time. And it is part of our brand. We really, really care about how these stores look. Now, from a P&L point of view, keeping a store very clean and tidy and repainting the store every six months is not always cost effective. Actually, on paper, some of our best, um, most profitable stores are the ones that haven't had a shop fit most recently. In fact, our Guildford store was desperately overdue for um, new lights and a bit of money spent on it. And uh, we decided, right, okay, we're going to do it. It's a, it's, a, it's a profitable store. We will spend the money. We closed the store for a week. We refurbed the whole thing. We put new lighting in. It was beautiful. It reopened and sales plummeted. Now, why? Why? Was it because our customers were used to the old store and they liked the dusty, dingy store? Um, we don't know. Actually, it was, they promoted for about six weeks and they've slowly built up and they are now higher than they were. In the UK, I can keep control of the brand. I can see what's happening um, and so can my fellow directors. Internationally, it's going to be much more difficult and it could be disproportionately expensive because were we to um, allow the, a franchise to a franchise operation to proceed in another country, we may spend more trouble, sort of uh, more time and money troubleshooting that offshoot of the business, which might mean we neglect our core business. So you've actually got to look at how, how, how much time do you have? What are your resources and where are they best spent or where are they best used? At the moment, we have limited amount of manpower and uh, without sort of in enlarging our head office infrastructure, we will, you know, we, we, we're pursuing it, but very, very gently. Like everyone in retail, like everyone in business, um, we're being extremely cautious at the moment. Um, with, 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 with the bad economic situation and the, the huge sense of uncertainty, we are in a bit of a dilemma. My, my biggest concern is not sales, um, are not sales. Our sales are actually, they're up on last year, they're up on target. Our sales are very, very healthy. And even in a recession, our sales generally do okay. I actually launched in a recession, so I'm not afraid of recessions. Um, one thing that does happen in a recession is people get made redundant, and when they get made redundant, they quite often think, well, I was a career girl, but now's a good time to have a baby. So actually, traditionally, the birth rate goes up a little, little bit in a recession. So I'm not particularly worried about um, our brand doing badly, but there are elements of an uncertain economic um, uh, situation which are out of my hands. I'm buying my stock in euros, in, um, in dollars, and... Currency fluctuation could, I mean, you know, the pound devalues, you know, we could go out of business through absolutely no fault of our own and not through being um, a, a bad retailer. So obviously we have to purchase options on our currency. We have to find a way of limiting our risk. And I guess that, that, that currency fluctuation and the way that it has affected us, and we didn't buy enough currency last year when, when Euro, the euro... Um, uh, gained against sterling, we lost out tremendously and we hadn't forward bought. We forward buy about 50% of our currency. We hadn't predicted how um, sterling was going to devalue against the euro. And um, it cost us a lot of money. It co in effect, it cost us our profit margin.